time of hearing God's word read and preached. But as I said this morning, as I start vacation tomorrow, I figured we'd do a kind of a one-off type sermon, again dealing with something new. And so this tonight we're going to look at Genesis 9, verses 1 through 7. If you have your scriptures with you or on your phone, take them out and look at Genesis 9, and look at verses 1 through 7. And before we actually hear our text read and preached, let's go to our Lord and ask his blessing upon our hearing what he has for us this evening. Please join me. Lord God, we do come before you. We thank you and praise you that you reveal yourself in a mighty way through your word. We thank you, Lord, for new beginnings that you give us, new years that you set before us. Lord, we ask as we hear this text read and preached this evening, you might truly awaken our eyes and our hearts to see that which you have for us. Lord, help us not just to be hearers of your word, but be doers. Help us, Lord, to see our need to share Christ with the world. Lord, be with me, your servant. Let the words I speak be not my own, but the words you've given to me to turn hearts to yourself, to edify your people, and bring glory to your name. For we ask this in Jesus Christ's most precious name. Amen. So Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Hear God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth, and multiply in it. When you hear someone say, be fruitful and multiply, what comes to your mind? If you're like most people, you think having babies, that that's what's in view. And this is why a lot of Christians believe that the whole purpose of marriage is procreation. That's why other Christians believe that unless you're married and have children, you're not fit to serve in what is one of Christ's officers in his church. But this type of thinking is short-sighted, deficient, and very limited. Because it misses the idea of what God is truly after. He's not just after more babies, but rather he's after godly offspring. And that's what we're going to see this evening. How what you see is God bringing about life through a new way. So I want you to follow along as we pack our text, and here's what you're going to see. First, a promise of life. Second, God removes obstacles. And third, blood brings life. And this is going to bring us to our big idea. Here's what you want to get down. Let this resonate in your hearts and your minds. Christ's blood brings life, so share his death. So first, a promise of life. Do you ever notice how a word or a phrase could mean different things depending on the context? There's not just one meaning. Now think about it. If you say somebody's hot, you might mean they're warm because they're wearing too many clothes. You might mean that they're really mad, or you might mean they have a fever. The context will control what's in view. And that's the same thing you see with God's word and right here in this text. Because what you're seeing here is God telling Noah and his sons to be fruitful and multiply. And this is not the first time you hear this phrase. In fact, God said the exact same thing to Adam and Eve back in the garden. But with them, it was a command. Here, it's more a promise of life. Look how our text begins in verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. You see the promise of life when you consider how this text differs from the circumstances and context of Genesis 1.28. Because back then, what did you have? You had Adam and Eve who were just made, and they were made perfect. They had this perfect communion with God, walking with them in the garden, and they were the only two people on the earth. So it makes sense. Go forth and get busy. Have babies. But here, things are a little bit different. Because what's going on here? 
Here you've got Noah leaving the ark. The world has just been flooded, and life is starting anew. And who does Noah leave the ark with? He leaves the ark with his wife, his sons, and their wives. So the world's been flooded, but sin still remains, and you've also got family units already in place. All you need to procreate and reproduce is already there. So what you're seeing here, this phrase is not about procreation, but it's a promise of life. And you see this again when you consider how Noah and his wife, at this point in time, they're about 600 years old, well past childbearing years. So think about that. Why would God be saying to them, listen, you need to get busy, go make more babies. They already got their babies. They got their sons. They're grown men with married wives. What is he doing here? What is he showing? He's pointing to the promise to send that Savior, that child, the one to be born that's going to crush the serpent's head. That's what's in view here. A promise of life. Because notice how it begins. God blessed Noah and his sons. And how did he do that? By preserving them through the ark, through the floodwaters. And now he's saying, this life I preserve for you is because of a reason. It's because of my plan, what I've got in mind, to send the Savior through the seed of the woman as promised long ago in the garden. And what you're going to see is this promise to preserve life, this promise to end death and sin, it's going to still come, but now through a new way. That's what's in view here. No longer through man's obedience, but rather through the obedience of one man, his perfect righteousness that's imputed to God's elect. That's how life will come. And that's why these words right here are a promise of life. And that's why you see God do what he does as our text moves on. Which brings us to our second point. God removes obstacles. Many people know the pain of not being able to conceive. This is a real problem for many married couples. And it's just as painful for many single men and women desiring marriage but unable to find a suitable spouse. And it's why we don't want to condition somebody's Christian standing or ability to serve based on whether or not they're married and have children. Because being married and have children is not what makes you special. It's not what says, now you really belong, now you're truly a Christian. What makes you special is God choosing you for himself. Not you choosing a spouse or God choosing to give you children. Because what do we know? Children are a blessing from the Lord. Not something you just conjure up to make yourself better. So you're seeing right here the idea that God chooses you, calls you to himself because he promises you life, because he removes obstacles. So what this means is, if you're here and you're struggling with the idea, I can't have children, or I can't find that perfect mate, don't spend your time on Match.com or your fellow children doctors, but look to your Lord, look to your God who you know removes obstacles. Anything that stands in your way, is not too big for your God. And this is where you find your hope as you see in our text. Verse 2, look what it says. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they're delivered. Why is that so significant? Because wild animals pose a real risk for man. You realize that? They're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger, and they got much sharper teeth. So if God's going to grow his earth, going to grow his society, he's got this problem. Because animals can destroy man. That means man needs to be protected so they don't just become prey to a hungry lion. So what does God do? He makes sure man's okay by putting something in animals that never existed before. And that's the fear of man. This is why animals, their first instinct when they're around man is not to attack you, but it's to flee, it's to run. They know they're in danger. And why is that? Because God's put that fear into them. I mean, think about it. God has said that they are food for you. Imagine getting invited over to someone's house for dinner, and you know they're cannibals. Would you be a little bit nervous? You might think you're on the menu. Well, that's what it's like for every animal. They realize that they're on the menu for you. They're tasty. They're enjoyable to eat. Think about that. Before the flood, man ate fruit, 
vegetables and vile weeds. <laughs> but now, what's God do? He gives us every animal to eat. All food for you. So much for the view that true Christians are vegetarians. True Christians like a good bird. <laughs> Verse 3 says it so clear. Look what it says. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And this shows how God removes obstacles. He removes your fear by making animals tasty for you to eat. And this means that they run from you. Or at least they're supposed to. Listen, from experience, that doesn't always happen. I once had possums in my office, and I was talking to them, explaining to them, Genesis 9 says you're supposed to be afraid of me. They got on their hind legs and hissed at me. <laughs> but ordinarily, they'll flee, they'll run. Because they understand that they're tasty, that we eat them. But notice what God does here. He does give a limitation. He says you can eat all the animals, but not their blood. Showing there's something significant about the blood. Look at verse 4, look what it says. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. These words are highlighting and pointing it to the significance of blood. It's the life or soul of the living being. And you see this in the Hebrew construction of this word. Nefesh dam, meaning life or soul is in the blood. That's where you find the life, in the blood. And this is why we put down animals who attack people, and it's why we kill people who kill people. Put them to lawful death. Because God says, death of man, taking his blood, requires the highest of punishments. And think about what this means. Noah lives in what's known as the post-Diluvian world. He has seen the brutality of man. He knows how quickly man can turn on man and kill them, just like Cain did to Abel. And so God is removing the obstacle of man himself by imposing the death penalty. Saying, you don't have to fear about people taking your life, because if they do, I will require their blood from them. God establishes right here the death penalty, and he shows there's something special about blood, particularly the blood of man. Look at verse 5 when it says, And for your lifeblood I'll require a reckoning, from every beast I'll require it, and from every man. From his fellow man I'll require the reckoning for the life of a man. When you look at how God says you're not to eat the flesh with the blood in it and how you're not to take another man's life, you get the idea that there's something significant about blood. And it's, this is where you see the crux of what's going on with this command to be fruitful and multiply. You're kind of getting the idea that you're seeing a new way. A new way that's going to come through the lifeblood. Think about this. Because Adam and Eve, who were created perfect, sinned, they created a new situation. Now things have changed. They brought sin into the world. So that means we cannot produce life. You realize that? Every single person born by ordinary generation has sin conveyed to them. You know what that says? All you can give birth to is more sin, more death. We cannot truly produce life. And that shows something very significant. Because it says, if we're going to multiply like God says, then there has to be a new way. And that's what you're seeing right here. What is that new way? It's pointing it to the new way, which points it to Christ. The one who took your sin on himself. Christ is the new way. And you see this clearly when you understand that you deserve to die. You realize that? You know why you deserve to die? Because your sin put Christ on the cross. You are guilty of taking innocent blood. You're a murderer. You realize that? Whether you lied in the slightest way, just coveted something one time, you deserve death for putting Christ on the cross, shedding innocent blood. And yet how does God answer your sin problem? By sending his own son to go to the cross and shed his blood for you. Through that shed blood, what do you get? New life. And you're seeing right here a new way. And you see this so clearly in Isaiah 53, 12, that speaks about how Jesus Christ pours out his soul or his blood to bear the sins of the money and to make intercession for you. That's why Jesus says in John 10, 11, that he's the good shepherd and does what? Lays down his life 
sheds his blood for his elect, for his sheep. Your sin is a mighty obstacle that stands in the way of you having life. And what does God do? As he always does, he removes obstacles. And he does it by sending his son to shed his blood so you might be brought to new life. And that's how you see God doesn't just remove obstacles for you, but he removes your greatest obstacle. Your obstacle of sin and death is dealt with because God removes obstacles. And he does so through Christ's blood, which brings us to our third and final point. Blood brings life. Do you ever notice how man makes laws that make you kind of scratch your head and wondering, what's going on with that? Why did that law get passed? Here's some laws that really make you curious. Alabama, it's illegal to drive blindfolded. <laughs> In New Jersey, it's illegal to wear bulletproof vests if you're committing a crime. And in Tennessee, it's illegal to share your Netflix passcode. Makes you wonder, like, what is man thinking? Do you really got to tell somebody not to drive blindfolded? Or you can't wear a bulletproof vest if you're going to commit a crime and rob a bank? But God, he makes it clear why he passes his laws. You don't got to wonder because he lays it out and tells you. That's what you see in our text. He makes clear what's behind what he requires. Look at verse 6. Look what it says. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. The for here gives you the reason for why God establishes the death penalty. Because man is made in God's image. That's significant. Of all that God created, all the creatures that move on the ground, only man, man alone, is in God's image. You know what that means? You are something special. If you're single, if you don't have kids, if you're married and have kids, you're special. Having kids, getting married is not what makes you special. It's God making you in his image, God choosing you. That's what you want to remember. Because God says there's value in this idea. And that's why we need to value, respect, and honor life. We need to really think about that. How God says we're to preserve and protect life. And that's because we're made in God's image. And that's kind of the idea that's in view as you think about this command or this promise of life to go and fill the earth. Because what God is after is not just any offspring, but specifically godly offspring. That's how you see in our text and how it ends. Look at verse 7. And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply it. This is the precise way our text begins. And it's the very thing that God says to Adam and Eve way back in the garden in the beginning. It's a creation command. And the command is something that the fall does not obviate. It continues to exist. It was there before the fall, and it's there after the fall. But there's a new way in view. Because think about it. God is repeating for no one of his sons what he told Adam and Eve. To go forth and multiply. To fill the earth. And he does this just as they leave the ark. First thing he says to them is leave the ark. Are these words here. And again, remember. He gives us command. Not just to Noah's sons. But also to Noah and his wife. Who are 600 years old. Well past childbearing years. Imagine being 90 years old. And God coming and saying, listen, I need you to have kids. You'd be thinking, there's no way I can do that, right? If God tells you you have to have children. Can you do that on your own? No. That's a blessing from God. But he's making clear here there's something else in for you when he says be fruitful and multiply. It's not just about talking about having babies, but it's talking about reproducing God's people. What's in view right here is the idea that you're to go forth and make God the offspring. And how do you know that? Because Malachi 3.15 makes this so clear. It tells you that what God is seeking is not just babies, but God the offspring. To multiply means to go forth, be willing to be used by God to save souls. To multiply means to make more Christian believers. That's what's in view here. That's the idea of multiplying. And how do you do this? By pointing people to Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, is that what you're faithfully doing? Or do you find your spouse and your kids taking all your time so you have no time for the world? 
See, God says you're to do it both ways. Raise up godly children in your home and raise up spiritual children out in the world. That's the idea here. Bringing people into God to create his people. Go and multiply by bringing the elect from around the world. So you do this by bringing up kids into your home through birth, adoption, foster care. And by raising up spiritual offspring by sharing Christ and his word, his crucifixion, death, and resurrection with all you know and you meet. You need to speak of Christ's death if you want people to understand how you get life. Because it comes through his blood. And that's how you see the dead raised to life when you share Christ and what he did. What is death, resurrection means. So let everyone you know, everyone you meet here, that Christ's blood brings life. I want you to notice something about your text. How it's laid out here. It begins and ends with the command to be fruitful and multiply. And right smack dab in the middle is the blood. And this shows you something so key. It's driving home what it means to fill the earth. And again, you see, it's not just about having babies, but it's pointing to not just natural children, but supernatural ones. And how do you make supernatural babies? Through the power of God's word, through his spirit, by having hearts changed. So what this means is share God's word. Share Christ, who he is and what he's done, with everyone around you. That's what you want to do in a year ahead. Because when you do this, now you're fulfilling God's command to go forth and multiply. And you're filling the earth. And you do this by letting everyone know how Christ shed his blood for their sin and their shame. He did this so they may be brought from death to life. Just let them know how Christ's blood cleanses them from their sins, purifies them, makes them new. If you want to do as God says and you want to be fruitful and multiply, you want to go forth and fill the earth, then you can't do it by sitting at home on your couch. you got to get out into the streets. you got to share God's word. You do it through the words you speak and the lives that you live. Let people want to know why you serve Christ, who he is and why he matters. So what this means is, if you want to fulfill God's command here, don't just stay home and have babies, but make sure the babies you have in your house and the spiritual children around you are hearing about Christ all the time and are seeing how he's in your life and makes a difference. Let them know, everyone in the world, what Christ's bloody death on the cross means for them, how it brings them life. Christ's blood brings life. So share Christ's death. Let's pray. Lord God, we do come before you this evening. We thank you and praise you, Lord, because you are so good to us. Lord, through this text of Scripture, we see a new way, Lord, your way that comes through Jesus Christ, Lord. Through his shed blood on the cross, we're brought to saving life. So we ask, Lord, we might have this message on our lips throughout our days. We might live it out, Lord. We might truly live as those who have been brought from death to life. Lord, help us to truly share with all around us how Christ blood brings life. Help us to share his death. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.